Hey, all you tiger and lion lovers, welcome to the Tiger Queens. This is about truth, rescue, and sanctuary, and I'm honored to be moderating this panel on behalf of the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance. Um, as we all know and probably have seen the infamous docu-series called The Tiger King a few months ago, well, the BCSA, Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance, wanted to bring some of its members together to discuss all those important issues that were completely missed during that docu-series. You know, there was, a, there was some light uh, shined on, you know, the issues in, of the big cat crisis in this country, but we wanted to get together to discuss the real problems about the exploitation of big cats in the U.S. and um, really talk about some of these queens that have you know, been founders of these sanctuaries that have had to take care of these animals that have become homeless due to some of the issues. And so I'm really honored to be, um, again, representing the BCSA at this time, but I've also been employed by Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge for over 21 years now, and I'm, I'm uh, the acting animal curator. It's an amazing job, so rewarding, but at the same time, rescuing shouldn't even be necessary but I'm honored also to be part of that team and being able to give these animals a, a safe place and a sanctuary and give them the best home forever. So we all know sitting here on this panel that these big cats have been exploited, used for money, thrown away. And about four years ago, three to four years ago, the um, Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance was formed. Um, and I'm grateful also to be sitting on the steering committee um, for the Alliance. And basically all of these sanctuaries and partner members have been coming together to improve the lives of big cats and, and all wild cats. But also, you know, we're speaking as one voice and trying to discuss issues and working together um, to, to educate the public and hopefully, you know, stop this, this um, big cat crisis that we're seeing right now um, that, that these animals are facing in captivity. So, Therefore, I've called these tiger queens together um, and founders who are also, um, you know, colleagues and, and friends. And I'd first like to introduce Tanya Smith, who is my boss, but also my friend and, and is honestly family to me. And she is the founder and president of Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, um, which is a nonprofit organization, uh, was formed in 1992, uh, Tanya and her parents purchased 459 acres just south of uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, uh, with the goal of saving and providing lifetime homes for unwanted and neglected exotic cats. Turpentine Creek is accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which we'll get into a little bit during this discussion, a licensed USDA facility, and also licensed with the Game and Fish of Arkansas. Tanya has been very instrumental in passing the law for the state of Arkansas, banning the private ownership of big cats and bears. Turpentine Creek has a huge uh, college graduate intern program that was started in 96. And we've had over 400 biologists and zoologists. They're now employed at zoos and sanctuaries and vet clinics and veterinarians all over the world. And then we have Bobby. Bobby Brink is also a friend mm -hmm. and colleague and the founder of and director of Lions, Tigers, and Bears in Alpine, California, which is also another uh, globally accredited uh, big cat and exotic animal sanctuary. And Bobby's been working with and advocating for captive big cats and bears and other exotic animals since the early 90s. Um, after witnessing firsthand abuse and, and neglect inflicted on captive animals that were victimized by the exotic animal pet trade, Bobby has made it her personal life's mission to end that abuse that stem from this industry, one animal at a time or whatever it takes. Bobby has a, plays an active role in managing all aspects of lions, tigers, and bears, daily operations from feeding the animals to resource development, office management. She's a prolific fundraiser and a tireless advocate for abused and displayed by cats, bears, and other exotic animals. Bobby's worked across the country to coordinate rescues and relocation of hundreds and hundreds of big cats, bears, and other exotical uh, animals, providing them the opportunity to live out their lives in sanctuaries, including her facility. And moving on, we're gonna head to Tammy Thies, who's also a friend and colleague, and is the founder and executive director of the Wildcat Sanctuary, another 501c3 nonprofit that provides a safe home 
to felid species, including cougar, tiger, lynx, and other wild cats in need of shelter. So Tammy made a midlife career change to become a voice for these animals. She began the wildcat sanctuary, and years later, the sanctuary houses over 100 residents on the 40 acres in Sandstone, Minnesota. Animals are not bought, sold, bred, or traded. Every resident is given the opportunity to behave naturally in a free roaming environment and receive the best vet care at their on-site animal hospital. And finally, Lisa Stoner, another friend and colleague out of Florida, 22 years ago, Lisa co-founded with her husband, Kurt, the Forest Animal Rescue. They're located on 80 acres of wooded land in the Ocala National Forest. A sanctuary is dedicated to the lifetime care of rescued wild animals, ranging from big cats to bears, wolves, primates, bats, and a lot more. So Queens, welcome. Thanks for being here. Let's start by defining a true sanctuary. Tammy, how would you define that? What licenses, permits are needed? What's going on with sanctuaries? Yeah, I mean, it can be confusing for the public, but a true sanctuary does not buy, breed, sell, or trade animals. And we are a home for life. All of us are a home for life. But it's more than just housing an animal. It's actually a true sanctuary looks at the individual needs of the animal. Um, and that might be medically, behaviorally, in the habitats, you know, veterinary care. It's a big job and we take it seriously. And true sanctuaries do not allow any public contact with members of the public and the animals we care for. We will not have, you won't see cub petting, you won't see photo ops, um, things like that. Uh, and, and each sanctuary might be different on the licenses they need because if you're open to the public, you're required to have a United States Department of Agriculture license. If you house native species, you might need to have different licenses within your state or um, native species. Some sanctuaries also do rehab and release. So all of us make sure that we're compliant, not only with the federal license, um, we also usually look at our state guidelines, our city, our township, um, and make sure we're compliant with all of those. And then on top of it, uh, reputable sanctuaries often will voluntarily go get an accreditation by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries or the American Sanctuary Association, because we want to meet those high standards of care safety, fundraising, and really that transparency to our donors and to the public. So very, very different than what you saw uh, on the roadside zoos in the docu-series. Absolutely. So Lisa, well, you know, what can you tell me and our audience about the places that claim to be sanctuaries, but they really aren't? Well, the problem is there's no legal definition of the word sanctuary. Anybody can use it in their name. Anybody can claim they're a sanctuary. And the general public doesn't necessarily know the difference. They think they're doing a good thing by paying a fee to go into this place. When they get there, however, they need to peel their eyes open and take a look and see what's going on with the animals. Are they being allowed to come within reach or touch any of the animals? Are they having a bunch of baby animals where there's no permanent location for them to live as adults? So it's never something that you necessarily know looking at someplace by their name. You have to really look and see what they do. If you look at their um, social media, are people posing for pictures with the animals? Are you seeing people in the enclosures with the animals? If you are, then it's not a true sanctuary. A true sanctuary is not going to allow that type of public contact for safety reasons and for the welfare of the animals. Just because the name may include the word sanctuary doesn't mean anything. Again, you need to look for the accreditation like we're accredited by the American Sanctuary Association. There's a global federation of animal sanctuaries those are the ones that make sure that the places actually walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. If you do see babies, you need to find out where they're, where'd they come from, why are they there, and where are they going to live as adults. If they're a true sanctuary, there should be a nice spacious habitat for them to spend the rest of their lives in, not get shoveled out the back door as soon as they grow up. Yeah, so some of that that you talked about sounds like maybe you were describing a little bit of the difference between a sanctuary. You may, you may have touched on the definition of what a roadside zoo is. So do you have anything else you want to expand on that or? Yeah, the roadside zoos are famous for letting people interact with the animals. They do cub petting and photo shoots and swimming with tigers and things that people think is a good thing. Everybody's smitten with these animals because they're beautiful, but they don't realize that they're contributing to 
the bigger picture of the cycle of abuse that happens with these animals in captivity. Bobby, we, we've touched a little bit on the, the um, Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and Accreditation, also known as GFAS, that we'll probably mention a few, a few more times um, throughout this um, video. But uh, what, what does the accreditation by that organization mean for your facility and, and for the animals? So GFAST is the main accrediting body of animal sanctuaries around the world. In order to be accredited, you have to meet really strict guidelines regarding not only habitat size, animal care, uh, safety, financial, uh, emergency drills and things like that. And not every facility makes the cut, but it gives a good framework for ensuring the best care possible and um, for captive animals. Accredited GFAS facilities, they don't buy, sell, breed, trade, or exploit animals. They are no contact, meaning um, no visitors or staff will ever have one on contact um, time with the animals or play time or petting time um, with, with animals like big cats or bears. So when you see a facility allowing the public to handle these type of animals, this is a huge red flag that you're you're in the wrong place, you're not at a true sanctuary or an accredited facility. Tanya, I know the Turpentine Creek is also accredited by GFAS. And so, you know, what's that meant to your organization? We wanted to make sure that we are doing the best, setting the best example, make sure that our animals are getting the best care. And that guideline really helped us out. How many cats has your organization rescued since 1992? Ooh, probably over 500 big cats uh, over 28 years. So it's just uh, been remarkable. You know, when it rains, it pours. We've been involved in quite a few large scale rescues over the years. And, you know, it's not just the mom and dad calling, saying they've got, you know, a couple big cats in their backyard, right? It seems to be big organizations that are going out of business and can't afford to take care of the animals or maybe PETA stepped in and actually decided that they were gonna fight and they go through long, battles through court, which takes forever sometimes. But, you know, it's really important that we just maintain the best standards that we can and move forward. All right, Bobby, Bobby, how about lions, tigers, and bears? How many, how many animal, how many big cats or, or cats in general? I know you guys rescue bears as well, but how many cats do you think you've rescued in, in, in your years of, of rescuing? Well, I've been working with the animals since 1990, but lions, tigers, and bears started in 2002. So right now we house and have helped over 30 big cats and um, easily helped to rescue 250 to 300 big cats across the country. Lisa, how about forest animal rescue? We are also a multi-species sanctuary. So we've rescued hundreds and hundreds of animals over the years, but out of that, the lifetime care that we provided are for like mm, about 33 or so uh, big and small cats, but we've helped and coordinated with other facilities to place several more, you know, hundreds more actually. And just about every cat that we bring in has been part of a collaboration with other facilities so that we work on the networking. That's the best, this teamwork is the best way to make it happen so that the animals are placed close to where they're having problems and get to the best facility for them as quickly as they can. And Tammy, how about the Wildcat Sanctuary? And you're also um, the chair of the rescue committee for the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance. So how many of you guys rescued personally? And then what do you think about the sanctuaries, you know, over the years and collaborating? You know, our sanctuary, probably about 300 cats ourselves that we've housed over the years. But when you add all being a rescue placement officer for Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance and over the years, how we've networked with other sanctuaries, sanctuaries you see on this panel and other great sanctuaries that are members, uh, probably over a thousand big cats, I mean, in just about 14 sanctuaries. And so when people say there isn't a big cat crisis, they're wrong. It just evolves over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and these are all outside of the accredited zoo system. All these rescues that these facilities are talking about are in private hands or roadside zoos. It's a crazy number to think about. Like when you think of the Alliance, which we're going to talk a little bit more about after, but like when you say the number over a thousand, you know, and the numbers that we hear out there, and I've been helping rescue for 21 years, but it still blows my mind. You know, and, and what people don't understand is there's a lot more that goes into that besides the actual rescue. So, Tammy, touch a little bit about what does it take to care for these animals? I mean, it's not simple. 
So it takes a lot to care for these animals and care for appropriately. When Sanctuary is put out there that it costs upwards of $10,000 a year to care for a big cat, and that's a healthy big cat, and that's a cat that you already have a habitat built for. Um, some people can scoff at that, especially the bad guys or the roadside zoos. Well, if you're caring for a big cat properly, it should cost that amount between diet, supplements, preventative vet care, you know, your trained staff, the dynamic habitat. And when you add on medical conditions that I know all of the sanctuaries see, it can be upwards of tens of thousands of dollars. And then when you want to build a new habitat that is free roaming space, dynamic space, in-ground pool, places for shade, heated and temperature controlled buildings, we heard a lot of sanctuaries have. I mean, this is expensive and it's a lot different than what you see in the roadside zoos in the docu-series. Um, and I know when I'm so happy to be among these colleagues, our staff has four-year biology degrees. We didn't hire somebody from Craigslist. You know, these people have animal <laughs> behavior degrees. They go through training. Many of them have been through several internships at other facilities even before applying. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it. And I know Bobby and both Tanya and Lisa touched on the safety. Safety is paramount at a reputable sanctuary, not only for the animals, but the communities we reside in. And that's why we don't have free contact. And that's why we do have drills and we do have liability insurance and barrier fence and i will tell you redundancy and safety protocol from shift areas to double doors um, to first aid training to firearms and a chemical immobilization training the list goes on and on and you won't see that at a roadside zoo absolutely so tanya how how expensive is it to to care for animals in a sanctuary because you can have some well, rarely, right, guys, we can all agree that an, on a rescue that you get some animal in perfect health or anything like that. So, you know, those expenses seem to vary, but, but how expensive is it, Tanya, I mean, to, to care for these animals? Our budget right now is about $2.8 million annually, and that's, um, you know, it's grown over the years because the need has grown, and um, everything's constantly changing and evolving, and we've changed and evolved. We have a on-site veterinarian clinic that's state-of-the-art. We have a, a part-time uh, veterinarian that lives and works right here nearby, so she's here working for us all the time, and if we need her, she's on call, and we have a wonderful team of seven staff biologists and zoologists and 15 interns right now. So it's a lot of people. Whenever these rescues come up, they come up quickly. We don't normally get a lot of time before the animal uh, has to have a home or it's going to be euthanized. So the expense involved in all that is just astronomical at times. And, you know, like Tammy said, you know, if we get uh, an animal with health issues, which the majority of us do because they weren't properly cared for or uh, taken care of, then that animal could cost you $100,000, not just $10,000. So, so keep that in mind whenever you're thinking about sanctuary work. It's really important and it's very expensive. So Bobby, what medical conditions have you had animals, uh, you know, different cats arrive with or or you know what's maybe something that's cost lions, tigers, and bears quite a bit of money to, to just for one cat. Right. So cats we've rescued have had so many different kinds of medical conditions. I mean, even simple like intestinal parasites, mange, malnutrition, always from the roadside zoos and the uh, cub petting. But we're pretty much able to treat them easily with medication and sound diet. Some need surgery, but then the other more debilitating ones like by the time the animal is rescued, they're irreversible. And just so many of the animals we've rescued have chronic disease just because of poor breeding practices. It's like arthritis, hip dysplasia, neurological, metabolic bone disease, dental disease. A lot of times bears in small cages will keep rubbing their mouth on the bar until they literally just destroy their teeth. It's crazy because most of these places have, don't do anything nutritional for these animals ever in their entire life until they actually get to a sanctuary. It's never too late, but at that point it costs us a lot, you know, everybody a lot of money to help these animals have the best life possible. So Lisa, let's start with you. What's the worst situation that, that you've encountered in a rescue over the years? What may be the most dangerous? Like, let's talk about that because, you know, in the, in the docu-series of Tiger King, you know, we, we saw a lot of dangerous stuff going on, you know, and that was just overlooked too. 
but what do you what do you feel i mean tell us a situation you've been in on a rescue and trying to to save an animal well we were called on to rescue a couple tigers in texas back in 2010 um their owner had them in a small like a dog kennel in the backyard he passed away he was in the house and had passed away and they didn't find him for a while so the cats have been out there without proper food or water for an extended period of time when they found them. Um, this was another collaborative effort. Tammy from Wildcat Sanctuary wound up taking the mother. We took the two sons. Um, they were adult males, but they were Tony and Roy. They were starved. They'd been mistreated severely. They, they hated anything human. They were so aggressive. Um, clearly fearful of people, fearful of strangers. And when we arrived, we had hired a, a Texas veterinarian so that we had a veterinarian properly licensed in that state for the tranquilization and all of that and any complications we might have. And he showed up and he saw the situation and promptly turned around and started to leave. And we had to let, literally beg him to stay. These cats were in dog kennels that were about eight feet high. And the only ceiling that was on them was, was sheet metal that was laying on top. It wasn't fastened down. When you dart a tiger, a lot of times they jump straight up, you know, or they'll jump in whatever direction. And a startled tiger can easily jump up eight feet. And then there's a platform there that they, literally they could just push and look right over the top at you. Uh, it was not a comfortable situation to be in. And then let alone the fact that there were nasty, you know, really filthy, disgusting pools of water in there that we couldn't empty. And if you tranquilize an animal, you usually would drain the water so that they don't go face down in the water when they're going to sleep from the dark. And there was no way to do that here. So there was a lot of risk of the animals or risk of the people involved. The veterinarian didn't want any part of it. We managed to make it happen. But these two cats were the most aggressive cats that we'd ever rescued. Um, they calmed down. It took them quite a while, but they learned to calm down and, and trust their caregivers and really enjoyed, enjoyed their time at the sanctuary and they've, they've thrived in, in acreage habitats with trees and space to roam and friends and they've done really well. But just to think the misery they were in and the aggression that they had was a result of fear. They clearly were, were mistreated for over seven years. It's just sad that they were left in that situation before they finally found a sanctuary. And that's, and that's what true sanctuary is, right? Seeing mm -hmm. that change in those animals and their behavior so Tammy, she had mentioned you were on that rescue too. So of course we all love hearing that, that when we're all collaborating together and, and helping rescue animals. But what, what's maybe the most dangerous situation you've been in with the Wildcat Sanctuary out on a rescue? What's interesting um, is, you know, there are cats that are really aggressive that we meet. And then there's cats that um, were used as exhibit animals. Uh, two tigers that we went to pick up were used at Renaissance festivals, were on leashes, um, and were free contact animals. And sadly, we got a call that the owner had been killed and partially consumed by one of their tigers. And going on that site, it was horrible, not only for the family, but for the cats we saw. Sadly, the cat that did attack her was put down and we were on site to remove the other animals. But these cats were underfed, were hungry, similar to what Lisa said. They were in 10 by 10 and 10 by 15 enclosures with no tops. Uh, their guillotines were just plywood. And people always said to me, why would you take such dangerous cats after they had killed a woman? And I said, they're not any dangerous than any of the tigers you see on those docuseries or the cub pet, the cubs you're petting that grow up. They just decided to be a tiger. So it was devastating and hard, but we always said too, is we could see by the reaction that these tigers had to men with facial hair or cats, we could have done a police drawing of that trainer that was not treating that animal appropriately. Um, and everybody who saw them on stage thought they were being treated perfectly and they weren't behind the scenes. And it took about a year for us to be able to approach that fence. And he ended up being a very nice tiger again, but his teeth were all rotten. He had no canines. They were broken off from chewing on the water bowl and the fence. And I mean, it's the same story you hear over and over and over again. And um, even my office cat is protesting the treatment of big cats. So uh, I'm just thankful for everybody's work and a chance to educate people that just because the scenario looks perfect right now does not mean it is behind the scenes or it'll be five years from now. 
Bobby, what about you? What's, what's the most dangerous situation you've been in? I think when we go out on the road and we just, you know, come across what we're going to come across, like a cat in Houston tied to a light post and left there, or um, going into a garage where a family had taken on some lions as pets. And so, of course, they had the big garage door shut and the door between the kitchen and the garage was the way they would throw the food in. So going in with the kids and things like that, where the people don't think about getting the animal out. You got to go in those situations and... and figure out how to get that animal out safely. A lot of times the cages aren't even strong enough to dart. If you know you dart and the animal goes up or sideways, the cage is going to come apart. So reinforcing cages and building something to literally get the animals out. Right. And Tanya, how about you? What's the, what's the most dangerous situation you've been, and, and I've been with you on some of them. So, you know, like what, what do you feel is the most dangerous situation that maybe you and, and your staff at Turpentine Creek have been in on a rescue? You know, whenever you bring that up, it just brings tears to my eyes almost because I think of all the different places that we've been and rescued in the field. And the, I mean, it all just floods back into your brain, almost like PSTD, you know. Was, we just did the rescue in Colorado. And, you know, I remember whenever Mama Shakira, we call her Mama Shakira, her name's Shakira. She's a pure white tiger that had four litters of cubs within a two-year period. We'd taken over a facility that had 115 big cats and bears on about seven acres of land. And the uh, containments uh, had been written up by USDA and the guy's been written up over and over and over and over and over and over and just never got anything happened to him. Nothing ever happened to him. He didn't get fined. He could continue to run his business. He would just run the business whenever uh, the USDA was not working, you know, Monday through Friday. They'd open up after five Monday through Friday and then be open again um, uh, on the weekends when USDA couldn't come out and inspect. And it just, um, Mama Shakira was uh, a sad situation. She was pregnant whenever we taken over the facility. We knew that she was pregnant. The mother had had a cub and left it in the middle of the cage that didn't have a way to lock the mother up. There was no way to go in and clean and sanitize anything in that facility. And we couldn't save that baby tiger. It would have been sitting out in the sun and without adequate um, care from the mother because she was so distraught. We ended up bringing in two cubs that we were able to save, but just the situation having to watch her endure the suffering and the pain and the anxiety of being in that area, it was just devastating, you know? That's just one of so many situations that I've seen over the years that, uh, you know, it just, it's sickening. It just is aggravating because we seem to want to do more and as much as we can for all these animals that need our help. And we're limited on what we can do. But, you know, the great thing is, is through that rescue, we were able to save all 115 big cats. And I appreciate everybody on the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance that help. Thank you all for what you do. I just want to say that because, and, you know, all these sanctuaries, because it's a dangerous, absolutely dangerous situation. Um, all the time to go in and rescue these animals. And, and you know, if, if people actually paid attention when they watched the Tiger King, they'd understand that there's also a big danger in the people that you're rescuing from. Well, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, the big cat crisis in the U.S. And Lisa, there's a crisis. Am I not right? There's definitely a crisis. Without intervention, this problem's not going to go away. We have to do something different. The system is clearly broken. The problem is not going away and people keep buying cubs, keeping them as pets, um, going out and petting them, doing all the photo shoots. And then as they grow, they wind up in different facilities and shift it around or put down or packaged for meat or a lot of awful things. But without fail, these animals get bigger and the people that started out with them when they were babies aren't equipped to handle the animals when they're adults. They don't have the proper enclosure. They don't have the proper disaster response skills. They don't have the ability to handle an emergency. There's nothing anybody can do for these, all of these big cats that would completely mirror what life in the wild would be. But if they can't be released in the wild, we have to give them the best we can give them. They deserve that. And the average person who tries to keep a big cat 
doesn't really look at it like that. They want the pet, they want to own this animal. The animal doesn't have a say in it. As the animal grows up, pretty soon it becomes a liability. It's dangerous, they don't know what to do, they don't have the ability to handle it, they can't respond in an emergency, they don't have what it takes. People are thinking about themselves when they get into it, not thinking about the animal. Bobby, what would be the thing you would like to say about cub penning and you know, what about these places that are saying that they're saving the tigers by breeding them? I mean, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, first, I'd like to say, please don't do it. Cub yeah. petting is an extremely lucrative business. You know, one facility, we can make $30,000 a week. And, and all of us here today know of, of some that make even more than that in a week. And um, many of the facilities, they just imply that their efforts are conservation when they're really not. It, it's the furthest from the truth. These animals are used for nothing more than to pay to play or to get their photo taken. Legally, they can only be used to when they're 12 weeks old. And then the truth is we don't always know where they go. So they're sold off to other facilities. Like you know, we've said, they're used for more breeding. They're killed for their body parts, for me, you know, given away as a pet. It's just a perpetual cycle of exploitation and abuse, and it's never going to stop unless people stop paying, paying to do it. So please don't do it. In a lot of our opinions, I, I, we don't think this, this problem is going to go away anytime soon. Um, so why do we think that is? We're hearing more and more about all these other places that these animals are in horrible conditions. And why are they still there, Tammy? Like, why, how are they still operating? I mean, I think it's twofold, right? I think one is you have the list and list of violations and violations, but it takes a long time to do the legal system to shut them down. Um, and it's very hard to shut down for animal cruelty because the laws are pretty weak. It's why we really need the Big Cat Public Safety Act. The other thing is, it's really hard. I want to talk to every individual who goes and wants to hold that little cub and, you know, social media and selfies have made it so easy. But that snapshot in time might be fun for you, but that cub has been ripped away from its mother. It's been passed around all day long. A lot of times it's hungry and they're just feeding it just to keep it quiet for your photo op. It often has ringworm. It can have metabolic bone disease. Um, it's gonna grow up in a 10 by 10 enclosure. I mean, as we talk about sanctuaries and rescues, we're usually the third, fourth, or fifth home for a cat or even more yeah. um, before they get to go to a good sanctuary. And so the best way, like Bobby said, is the authorities aren't going to shut them down. And when you look at a local sheriff um, who people call, they're not equipped to handle how to close a 50 animal facility, how to respond to a tiger crisis. Um, that is not their forte. They, they need help. You look at the local um, attorney general. I mean, you know, we're trying to get some to them to move because these people often are nonprofits um, exploiting their mission, which is not true conservation. It's a conservation myth. And so we need people to stop doing cub petting and realize that their little moment of joy is causing a whole hardship of life for um, big cats. And I can tell you, if your kids knew the truth, they would be the first telling their parents, please don't do a cub petting um, opportunity for me. But the sad reality is the exhibitors don't tell you the truth. So um, just like when you go to a car salesman, he's going to tell you what you want. You go to a tiger breeder, he's going to tell you everything that you want to know. You need to do your research and find right. a better way to be part of the solution, not the problem. Well, we really need to get into the Big Cat and Public Safety Act, right? Because we all feel that this could actually you know, really make a difference. But one of the things that I feel we need to touch on is this is so necessary on a federal and national level because, Lisa, what's going on in the states? These animals are crossing from state to state. They're being sold in one place and bought in another. And so they'll slip through the cracks and not get tracked properly from one place to another because it's all regulated piecemeal in 50 different states. So by controlling who's allowed to have these animals in what situations is going to definitely increase the safety of the public and the responders that are expected to handle the situation when something goes sideways and the local law enforcement has no idea how to approach a tiger in somebody's house that's just injured somebody. Um, the animal winds up being shot because that's the only thing that the law enforcement agents are able to do 
and it should have been the responsibility of the person who had the animal to not only prevent something like that from happening, but be qualified and capable of tranquilizing the animal or taking care of it on their own without local law enforcement being dealt that hand that they can't handle. Exactly. So clearly there's lacking in state laws, there's lacking in training, there's lacking in everything these animals need to protect them. So Tammy, address the Big Cat and Public Safety Act. What is that bill going to actually do for, for these cats and how is it really going to help the crisis? Well, I th think the foremost thing is that it ends the public interaction. It ends the biggest reason why these people are overbreeding and speed breeding these tigers with nowhere to go. And these tigers are breeding have no conservation value. They've been inbred. Um, they're now doing hybrids, you know, white tigers with genetic issues. And so this bill is really needed because it also um, is a public safety bill because people owning big cats is dangerous, not only for the people owning them, but the communities around them. And maybe some of us sanctuaries wouldn't be so necessary, which I personally would like to see in my lifetime. You know, that was my goal when I started this, what sanctuaries wouldn't be needed and that there wouldn't be cub petting within my lifetime. And I'm just hoping to, to see that day. Danny, do you want to touch on anything about the, the Big Cat and Public Safety Act? Because I mean, it's just, it's important to every sanctuary right now. And what, what does it mean for the sanctuaries? Well, it would mean that we could go out of business. And I know that uh, as a sanctuary leader and as somebody that really cares about uh, the future of these animals is that we wouldn't be needed as much anymore. And it could stop and it could stop in our lifetime. And that's pretty exciting to be able to run a nonprofit and know that we could stop this problem within our lifetime.